resume recording. There we go. Great, thank you, Drew. Drew is my colleague in the Center for Data and Visualization Sciences, and is actually a specialist in GIS and spatial analysis. So um, he's a handy person to know. Okay, so then we're gonna ex uh, I'm gonna expose you to how to do these queries and how to do the visualizations, and hopefully point out some useful documentation along the way, because quite honestly, there is a ton of documentation. And if you're anything like me, while you recognize the value of reading the documentation, you often need to read the documentation. Sometimes you just want to get started and see what you can do. And so I'll try and point out where that documentation is so that you can reference it later. But in terms of background, one of the things I said in the um, registration is that we're building on earlier knowledge of um, what we know already about R and the tidyverse. So workshops that I've taught in the past. So if you don't know about it, there is a website called RFUN, which is a sort of a sub-branded site for my department where I'm collating a whole bunch of R workshops that I've done before. And uh, we're basically building on the first two sections of quick, with, quick Start with R. So in particular, just to do a little bit of a review, let's take a look at the Deplier cheat sheet. Now you can get this cheat sheet from within from within our studio. And you can also get it from this location right here. If you just free text the search, search the word deplier on there, you'll find this cheat sheet. And so just as in terms of a slight review of deplier, what deplier allows you to do basically is to transform data, right? So the, the verbs that we're really gonna be concerned with today are filter and select and mutate and arrange. Okay, so let me expand my screen so this is a little bit easier. I won't belabor this too much, but filter, if you have a grid-based rectangular data frame and you just want to limit the rows or the cases or the observations, depending on what you call it, you would do that with filter. So in this visual representation, you're limiting a four-row data set down to one row, with the dark gray being the header. If uh, similarly, we can select or limit or subset by variable or column, that's the select function. And so in that case, it's selecting from a three column or three variable data frame down to a single data frame. And I think most of you probably know what I'm talking about. So again, I don't wanna belabor that, but I just wanna review. This is what we're gonna leverage is the ability to do these kinds of things and have that and have R or R Studio or the Tidyverse, really specifically Deplier, transform what we already know about Deplier and it'll do the transformation into a different query language. So um, two more um, functions that are important. One is mutate where we can create new variables, right? So if we have a three variable grid, uh, let's say that's A, B, and C, and we wanna add A, B, and C together, we can create a new variable called D that is the sum of A, B, and C or whatever kind of math we want to do. And then uh, lastly, arrange, which allows us to sort the rows or the cases or the observations by a variable in one of the columns, right? So I think everybody already knows that, but that's what we want to leverage. We already have that knowledge. Uh, so let's see how that gets done. Let me go back to my slideshow. Uh, sorry, this is the way I want to start. We were just talking about grid-based data frames, right? Technically, this is what we're going to call a flat file, and folks who are using R are going to be very familiar with flat files. This particular um, glimpse of a flat file, just like the first eight rows, is from a data set called MT, MT Cars. that comes kind I don't know that it comes on board with R, but you can easily get access to it by loading, installing the data sets library. Um, and it's very similar to us. It's, it's grid data, it's not huge, and we can apply all of those deplier verbs that we've learned to transform the data so that we can eventually visualize. In contrast to a flat file is a relational database. Now there are lots of different kinds of databases, but relational databases have been around easily for 40 years. They're very robust, very mature technology, and they were designed for a couple purposes, but um, one of them is to handle voluminous data. So the difference between a flat file, which you can think of as a single table and a relational set of tables, is that they all have keys 
that, li that link one table to the next. So this whole relational database is information about sales of some kind of product for some kind of company, right? So this one small table here, which is very efficient, really consists only of IDs or keys to other tables plus the number of units sold. So if I need to know, uh, let's say I sold, I have one row that says I sold four units on February 23rd, I can use this key to go look up the date in the date table of, for February 23rd, and I can get more information about that date time. I can similarly look up the key to get more information about the store that sold the product, and similarly use the product ID to get more information about uh, the product itself. So one of the things that's happening with this relational table is it's a very efficient way, a very compact way to store volumes of data, uh, but it's also a very efficient way to do a lot of uh, computational subsetting and analysis, just happens to be not what we do in R. So there's a whole series of uh, database engineers and database administrators who know that stuff very well. Uh, but for my purposes, I'm going to pose as a person who doesn't know too much about SQL. And that's exactly what gets what happens here. So just in terms of a comparison, this is a very generalized comparison, difference between a flat file and relational file. And all of these very generalized comparisons have uh, footnotes or, or exceptions. But the flat file is usually good for a single user, whereas a relational database is going to be good for multiple users. Um, relational databases are usually in the cloud, whereas a flat file is likely going to be just on one single disk space. Um, you can do simple queries with a flat file. You can do very advanced queries with a relational database. Uh, flat files are usually static. They don't have to be, but um, most of the data that I'm analyzing in R doesn't change a whole lot, changes very occasionally. Whereas, I don't know if this is true that uh, relational databases got developed for the banking and, and finance industries, but banking and finance industries quickly adopted them, partly because their data is very dynamic. And they have issues where there could be collisions of data where multiple people are putting in the same information and relational databases are just designed, most of them, many of them, the ones that are in existence are designed to handle this kind of dynamism. Um, there are different kinds of relational databases that have different qualities, but let's just stick with that, stick with the general. Uh, flat files are usually only good up to a certain size, whereas if you get over two um, gigabytes, is that right? Two gigabytes to three gigabytes? I, actually, for, right now I'm forgetting the unit, but at a certain size, um, R will start to break down. You just can't load that much into memory, uh, whereas a relational database is really designed for these volumes of data. And of course, the structure can be much more complex, like I was showing there. Okay, so these complexities and these nuances, uh, sure, they're a good thing, but I, I want to caution, I am not trying to sell you to move all of your data into a relational database. That's not my purpose here. Um, there are many good reasons to keep your data in, in a flat file, not the least of which is the amount of effort you have to put into administering your data, the backups and things like that. Um, but there are several good reasons to pursue the more complex data structures and deliveries. Uh, you should just be aware that as you pursue these more complex approaches to managing your data, you have more expense, right? There's more computational expense, there's more financial expense, there's more administrative expense. And when we start talking about really, really large amounts of data, um, we start then adding in at least large organizations, people like database engineers and database administrators uh, to ensure that there is some data integrity. Um, what I'd like to do is at this point kind of to just to talk about that data integrity is, is to sort of underscore that. The reason why there are people who are focusing on this is because we have come to know, if we didn't know it before, companies like Tidy, uh, Twitter and Google and Amazon have sort of made it really clear that data starts to become the new oil as it were, meaning it's very, very valuable. And so if you're gonna put all of your data into one system, you need to make sure that it doesn't get corrupted, that you can continue to, continue to get the data out, things of that nature. So I just wanna underscore that. I am not trying to tell you that you should put your data in a database, but you may be running across situations where you have so much data that you wanna do that. And I wanna make sure that you're aware 
And among other things, R can access that database. Um, also, it's just cool that we're going to use Google BigQuery as our example. So now, I mentioned earlier, I did a really quick visual overview of the Deplier cheat sheet. And here's a basic um, Deplier query right here. And if we piped that Deplier query where we're just filtering by a few variables or a few columns, if we piped that to a function that we haven't discussed before called show query, it would actually deliver for us an SQL statement or a structured query language statement. That's what you see over here. These two statements are basically equivalent. Um, now there, there are different dialects of SQL. It is, it is a industry standard. And so there are sort of slight dialects between Oracle's version of structured query language and Microsoft SQL servers version of structured query language. But generally speaking, the basic stuff works the same. And that's what the plier is able to do for you by being on the front end, it can decide if you're querying, if this object right here is actually a database, it'll decide to broker that request through DB plier. And then it will in the background send a statement that looks more like this to the relational database management system. And then we'll get some data back. Uh, I also included this left join statement, not that they're related, but if anybody's worked with relational SQL or relational databases, you know because you have a lot of these connected tables um, that you often have to do a lot of joins and merges to get some larger flat file kind of structure that you can analyze, right? Now in tidyverse context, we don't do a whole lot of joins necessarily. You might be, depending on your data, you might be doing a lot of joins, but the the syntax for those joins, while I might be able to pull this out of my head because I've worked with databases in the past, the syntax for the join, I'm always going to have to look up because I don't do it that often. And so this is one more advantage to doing the deplier approach, which is I don't have to look up the SQL syntax. I can just use the deplier syntax that I already know. All right, so some questions that I'd like to address, like why would you do this? Well, one is, it's especially convenient if you already know the plier. Like you really don't have to, especially if you're only querying to bring in more disparate sources of information. You don't have to go out and learn SQL. Uh, you can just stick with the plier and it's probably gonna work really, really well until you get into these really advanced SQL queries. Um, and we're not, I'm not gonna demonstrate any of those points where it breaks down because I myself generally don't do those super advanced queries. Um, Another reason to do it is it's more efficient. Um, I think I talked about this, but at a certain point, you just can't read that much data into your RAM using R. Uh, and the general idea is in a big data context, I'm repeating myself, but you want to do your transformations and your data processing where the data are. So you're moving your compute to the data. And that's exactly what Google BigQuery allows us to do is it allows us to have control over the compute structure where the data exists, happens to be in the cloud, somebody's server room somewhere, uh, but not ours. And then the other technique then, of course, is to visualize, and in this, in our case, visualize using ggplot, which we already know, rather than having to learn a whole nother, like some other query visualization approach. Last bit just being that, it, another reason to do this is just that it's access, right? That there's there are a lot of databases available to you. Um, it's good to, to bring in those disparate sources anytime you can, especially if you don't have to maintain that data, if you can just have some faith, some reasonable faith that that data is worth looking into. So it's not hard to get started. I gave you a link. Um, before I go too much further, actually, let me see, I see Jonathan Holt asked a question. In theory, can a relational database always be transformed into a big flat table? Uh, I'm gonna say in theory, yes. Um, uh, I, you don't always necessarily need to transform it, however, into a big flat table. You just need to transform it so that you get the data that you, that you want to view. And in R, the simplest, most convenient uh, sort of metaphor is that flat table. Although R has different kinds of data structures, matrices and, and lists to name just two. So you don't necessarily have to transform them into flat files, but that seems to be a, a convenient way to think about your data. 
Uh, so all the all the code that we're going to look at, I sent out earlier. If you don't have that, um, just pop me a note in the in the chat box, and I'll send you the link again. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at the um, Google Query Sandbox. Um, if you haven't already, you want to install Tidyverse and the DBI package and Big R Query. You really don't actually. I sent this out in the in the registration notes. You don't actually have to install DBplyr because it will be installed as part of Tidyverse. But I just left it in there to emphasize that we're actually going to be indirectly uh, through DBplyr using DBplyr. So let's take a look now at um, at Google BigQuery, just so we know what we're getting into. All right, so there's some links in the README file down at the bottom to different kind of views of Google BigQuery. If you'll excuse me for just a minute. Um, so there's a free tier for the Google Cloud Platform. And that's, I'm pretty certain how I signed up to use it. Now I want you to know this is the first time I've taught this particular workshop. And I was reluctant to kind of uninstall all of my connections to Google Cloud Platform just to make sure that I was telling you everything right because then I was afraid sometimes when you're teaching workshops like Murphy's Law has a tendency to, to rear its ugly head right when you're about to start the, start the class. And I didn't wanna undo what I'd already done. So I can't tell you for certain if I'm connected to Google Platform I, under this approach, the free tier where you have to provide a credit card even though you're not getting charged or if I'm using the Google Query Sandbox. But the Google Query Sandbox is supposedly for people who don't have a credit card to provide, right? So I'm gonna to link to that. And what you'll see here is a setup that explains how the Sandbox works, tells you everything you need to do and even gives you a, a link to the Google Cloud Console, which we're gonna to connect to in a second, but basically it looks like this, right? So shifting back here, these are one of two ways that you can connect to the BigQuery uh, public data sets. And neither one of them should cost you any money. But um, I'm not a Google product manager. I'm not a Google rep. Uh, I, if it does cost you money, I, I would apologize. But I, I have no way of knowing how it would cost you money. My experience so far, I've been using this for, I would say, well over six months. I've not been charged a dime. I've only been querying the public data sets. And from my understanding, you can query like up to a terabyte of data a month without being concerned about any kinds of charges. Uh, and I'm definitely not gonna do that today. So it should be safe and good for you. But um, like I said, I, I don't have so much knowledge about the, the Google Cloud platform that I can explain exactly how the pricing works. So it's, it's, it's worthwhile to be cautious. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to cert, we're going to query some of these public data sets. So I'm going to right click and open that table or that tab. And here's a fuller explanation of the public data sets. And if you click on this link, it takes you to what's called the cloud marketplace, which uh, I only want to show you so you can see it. I personally find it not super helpful, but it's kind of like a play, like an Apple Play Store just for like what free data, I think what free databases are out there. I don't think they're charging for any of these. Uh, so it's there, it's, I don't know why, but I have noticed some disparities between what shows up here and what we're gonna see once I get into my Google platform, my console. Uh, so I, I just wanna point that out, but I don't wanna rely on it. Cause really what I wanna do is I wanna get to my Google BigQuery console. So this link right here, which I'm going to put into the chat. If you have already set up your uh, Google BigQuery, that should go straight to what you're about to see. But I'm going to take one more half step to get there indirectly and just go straight to the BigQuery page where it has this blue link that does the same thing. Uh, it goes to the console. And this explains you know, kind of what the BigQuery tool is and how you access it with a little video. My experience with BigQuery is there is there is a wealth of documentation, and I've showed you only or I've provided for you only the links that I think are really really necessary to look at. 
Um, there's so much documentation that you could probably spend a week just reading documentation without ever actually having accomplished anything. But what I want to do is I want to go to the console. So I'm going to click on that. And now we're looking at a cloud version of Google Cloud Platform. And <clears throat> if I clicked on this little, um, I forget what you call that. Let's just call it the hamburger icon. Um, you can see that in my, I've registered onto the Google Cloud Platform and I have at least two services available to me. One is the home dashboard and one is BigQuery. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I've never used and I don't know if I will ever use it. The other thing that I can see here is a, a reference to all of my projects. And if you don't have a project, you might have to click new project. I'm sorry, again, in terms of, a, <coughs> excuse me, a first time user, I don't know if you already will have the Google, the BigQuery dash public dash data project pinned to your um, workspace, I think you will. But even if you have that pinned, you're gonna wanna create a project. All right, so you need a project which might be used for billing if you're on the free tier, even though I've used one for billing, I don't get, I don't get billed because I'm using public data sets. If you're in the sandbox, I don't know that you even need a project, I'm sorry. I can't help you with that level of Google Cloud Platform detail, but that's how you create a project if you need one, right? And when I created a project, one of the projects I created was this one called Workshop-Barfun 2021-Spring. Now, this is just for me. You don't have access to this. You have to create your own if, in fact, you need to do that. But let's just put that, to, put that aside for a moment. This is the Google public data sets right here. And so if I expand that, I can scroll through this really long list of public data. And one of the things that's worth pointing out is even when you get down here to this really, really long list, there's even more, right? There are just a ton of large public data sets out there. Bunch of information about San Francisco, film locations, bike share programs, San Francisco trees, um, information about Stack Overflow, Wikipedia. It's mind boggling <clears throat> how much stuff um, you can actually find here, and it's fun to, to browse through it. And we're going to look at some of these. We're going to start with um, the COVID data that is right. Let's see, which one is it? This one right here, COVID underscore JHU underscore CSSE, right? So that's one data set. And if I expand that, you can see the relational tables that make up that data set, right? There's one called confirmed cases, one called deaths, one called recovery cases, one called summary. Um, so um, we're gonna look at the summary table. And if I click on the summary table, you can actually get a listing of the columns or variables that exist in that particular table, right? And that's what we're gonna query. Now you can do your querying right here in the console. There's, a, there's an editor right here. And also if I, if I scroll down here, I can get a query history of stuff that I've queried in the past, um, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna use Deplier to do my query. So now that you've got this orientation, the important part here for me is to know A, that you have this, project right here called bigquery-public-data to know that you can navigate that to data sets and then ultimately to tables within the data set. Know that and know that you probably have to have your own project to associate billing that you will probably never be charged for. All right. So at this point, I'm going to go from, from this uh, repository I'm just going to open up my Google project. So if you haven't done this before, you can download this zip or, or um, open the repository in any R way that you feel comfortable, stuff that we've kind of covered in the past. OK, so here's the repository. And if I downloaded that zip file, I could expand it on my local system. And when I expand that on my local system, um, I'm eventually going to get to uh, our studio 
which is where I'm going to go right now. And I want to make sure that I share my R Studio. So you should see a blue screen now that is dominated by my um, my project that I opened up. And I opened it up by in my local file system, clicking on that file. And this is my file system, and this is my console, right? So let me get rid of those drawings that I drew on the screen and go back to my mouse. And I'm going to open up this file here called 01 Case Study Google BigQuery. And I'm also going to try and make this bigger for you to see. Um, before I do that, let me just note, because I mentioned it before, here under help, here's cheat sheets, and here is data transformation with the plier. So that's quick access to that cheat sheet I was mentioning before. But what I want to do is I want to kind of alter the appearance of this a little bit so that you can see better. All right, that makes the screen larger, and I'm going to make it a single screen. And there should be enough text in here in this R Markdown document that you can read through it. Some of the stuff I've just discussed, like if you don't have a credit card, go to the sandbox, et cetera. But getting to this part of the um, line 27 of the code, I'm just going to run this first code chunk. And I had the warnings turned off. And that's going to load these three libraries. The, the critical ones for querying BigQuery are DBI and Big R Query. Again, using Deplier, which is part of Tidyverse. And the very first thing we want to do is use the DBI library to establish a connection to this remote cloud-based database. So this is where the stuff I just showed you in the console comes into play, right? The project bigquery-public-data, if I can uh, share my other screen, just to bring this clear, make it clear. That's this right here. OK, so that's the project. That's the data set. And that's the table. And this project is what I'm going to use for billing. So going back, that's how I fill that out. That's my project. That's my data set. That's my billing ID. And when I run that, all I do is establish a connection to the remote database. Gives me a little bit of feedback there. I'm going to use that object going forward. Now, you may have to, at this point, type this into your console. right? So let me just make this clear what I mean by the console. Here we go. Big query. Big query BQ off. And what that should do, I don't know if you have to do that or not, because, oh, I spelled that wrong. Big R query EQ off. What that should do is broker a connection through your uh, web browser to establish that you have uh, the proper permissions, authentic authentication and authorization to query BigQuery remotely. But I've done it so many times that it's not going to query me to do that. So I'm just going to go on and use this next function table. And this is where I'm connecting to that summary table, part of the data set, the COVID-19 JHU CSSE data set. This is just one relational table of, I think there were four. So first I made the connection, and then I'm going to connect to the table. And I'm going to make a pointer for that. I can call it anything I want, but I'm going to call it my DB pointer. I should probably call it my table pointer. Um, and you'll notice as I did that, that I have a little waiting uh, icon there. It tells me that I have to go ahead and further make my uh, connection through my Google account. So I know that for me, I just have to go into the console and type the number one, choosing one option, because I could have other options, and hit enter. OK, and it makes that establishes that connection. Now, you can set that to all run in the background so you don't have to keep on typing in the number one in your console. Uh, but I've been proceeding cautiously, trying to make sure that I don't accidentally you know, run up charges that I don't need to. Um, and so 
since I don't actually want to get charged for anything, I don't mind typing in that number one. But if you were doing something more production oriented, of course, you would not want to do that. You would want to establish what your barriers were, but break down the connection possibilities. Okay, or connection barriers. All right, so all I've done there is I have created another pointer that connects to the database and the table. Now I can use a deployer function called glimpse, which for those people who are familiar with uh, base R is roughly the same as stir, but not the same. Uh, and I can use glimpse to uh, approximate this SQL query right here. If you look at this SQL query, it's select star from this location, right? From bigquery public data dot blah, 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 dot summary table. And there's also importantly, I'll just point this out, importantly limiting to only getting 10 results because I don't want to query the whole database. It could have millions of rows in it. I just want to get a sense of what's in there. And I can do that with my uh, deployer function glimpse. And it comes back and it tells me the stuff that I wanted to know, like there are 13 variables, what the data types are for those variables. and gives me a little preview of each column and what the data are in each one of those columns. Um, it does not, however, tell me how many rows because it doesn't know how many rows because it's trying to be economical in what it's, in what it's consuming at the remote database end, right? So the glimpse command is probably doing something very similar to limit 10. And, and as a result, it doesn't know how big the data frame is that it's, that it's querying. If I wanted to find that out, I could use another deployer function called count. And when I run that, it'll go hit that remote database and come back and give me an answer, which is roughly equivalent to this SQL command, uh, select count star from summary table. And what is that number? It looks like a million, million two, one, one million two hundred and eighty nine rows of data for this, this one summary table right here. Okay, so I made that connection. Now, I don't know that I really want to belabor this, but I just want you to know if you really want to do SQL queries, you can do them. This is the syntax for doing an SQL query. I would move this up here to make it a live active um, code chunk, but I want to I want to leave it that way so that I'm not doing that. Um, but using the DB query function to the con statement, the connection statement that we made earlier, or connection object, I should call that, we're then sending a full SQL query, and we can get some some results. Or if we wanted to write it out, we could write it out like this and put that assign it to a to a different object name and that's all that i'm showing here is just different ways to actually send full on sql queries which you might want to do if your deployer queries are not accomplishing what you want um, <clears throat> but let's proceed with the assumption that we're just interested in querying that's what deployer is really good for is is doing querying there's lots of other things you can do with databases like inserting new records making you know renaming tables um changing permissions the plier is not going to do all of that stuff but it's excellent for querying uh but if you need to do advanced stuff like that you probably are going to end up writing out sql commands in this kind of fashion right here's a different command that does something very similar to the glimpse command it's part of a different library it's part of the big r query library uh and you'll notice some similarity right here in that um, we have the, the data source, the data, the data set, and then the data table, in this case, Austin Bike Share. And if I run that command, it's going to come back and tell me what fields are in that bike share, bike share trips table and what the data type is. Right. So that's just one more way of doing it. It's a little more SQL like. Uh, than the response you would get back from, from Glimpse, which is more tidyverse like. But moving on to deployer, right? Let's just go ahead and start doing some deployer searches. So you've seen this already. We did this a moment ago. We're going to use the table command, make a connection to the summary table, and we're going to give it a name. We've already done this. We've done it once and we called it my, what is that, my DB 
pointer, I think is what it's called. Uh, but let's just do this again. And you'll see up here in the environment variable, I have all they are are lists. They don't like a data, like a R data type called a list. It's not very complex. It doesn't have a lot of information in it, but it contains all the information that R needs to connect to the remote data set. If I actually wanted the data, I would have to follow by saying, by uh, piping in the collect function. And <clears throat> you can do that, but just know that uh, you might want to do that sparingly. It's kind of hard to say what is the exact rule, but the, the rule that I use in my head is let me, let me pull data over the wire or over the internet as in it sparingly and as few times as possible, because every time I connect and gather data from the remote data source in this, in this context, it's somehow expensive, computationally expensive, possibly financially expensive. If, you're, uh, if you have a database administrator who's managing data for you and it's all local Duke stuff, they probably don't care how many times you hit the uh, database server. But again, I'm trying to be conservative here because I don't really understand when Google BigQuery is going to charge me and I don't want to be charged. So there's no harm in me being conservative in this case with how many times I hit the data set. But I have this pointer to uh, COVID data to the summary table. And I can initiate this command and it will pull back, in this case, a grid table that looks like a standard table that we're used to in Tidyverse. Uh, in this case, it tells me that there are 101 rows and that's, I haven't done very much processing here, right? This is basically one row per county in North Carolina. If you look at this query, it's querying the summary table where the state equals North Carolina and where the date equals June 30th of last year, and then making a selection of a particular set of um, columns or variables. So if I had assigned that to this object, then every time I hit that object, uh, it's actually going to requery the database. Let me let me zoom back out here in my R Studio so that you can see. This object that I just created, which is right here, they're all lists. None of them have any size to them because they're all dynamic. Every time I call this, it's going to requery the database and it's going to tell me, well, it's billing me zero and it downloaded a page. And in this case, 101 rows. So not a lot of data, not very expensive. But again, we could do more with that. If I specifically wanted to see uh, what kind of query that was going to produce, I could pipe that to show query. And before it even goes to um, out to the Google BigQuery, it's just going to give me back the SQL statement that it generated. It can be handy because maybe I want to do a more advanced SQL statement, but I can just use this as the sort of cheat sheet stub of what I'm going to what I'm going to um, modify in my SQL query. And that's what's happening right here. Uh, but here's a couple more variations of just doing sort of straight up, straight up um, applier kinds of searches. And if I'm not mistaken, it's not going to be until we get here where we actually pull back data into memory and keep it there. Right? So we can run these one at a time and you can watch how the environment changes. But you've seen this already. That's the glimpse command. Um, this is a particular search, which is, uh, I think, the same search I've done a couple times. But all it's doing is creating another pointer to the search. If I execute that search, it will bring back data, 101 rows. And if I execute that search and say collect after it, so my search and then collect, when I do that, um, in this case, maybe to make that a little bit more clear, let me do this. I'm going to say uh, my foo table. And now when I run these next set of rows all at once, you'll see that my foo table over here in my environment section will actually now have data in it, right? So that data is all sitting in my, my local RAM. All right. So again, this is this idea of whether or not you want to do your computation remotely or do your computation locally. All right. 
I think this says everything that I was just going to say, so that's redundant. But the difference here is, I'm going to go ahead and do this with the collect statement, is that in this case, I'm getting all of the data, not just for June 30th, which is what's happening right here, but I want all of the data since April 1st of last year. So all of the Durham, North Carolina um, deaths, well, summary, all of these variables for the summary table, but just for Durham, North Carolina, because that table is huge. Not only does it have all 100 counties for all dates from April 1st forward, but it has all counties for all the data they've collected, right? And so that's the, comp that's the amount of data that I don't want to pull into my local RAM. I'm just interested in data for Durham, North Carolina from April 1st forward. And that's what I will collect into my local RAM so I can do a further analysis on that data. So that's what's happening here, is I'm, I'm essentially writing my deplier query, which gets transformed into an SQL query, and then through kind of tidyverse magic, brings back a local table, 330 rows representing the number of days since April 1st of last year that has information about COVID-related issues, right? Confirmed cases and deaths, primarily what I'm interested in. But notice that the data are not sorted, right? I've got May 14th, and then I've followed by uh, September 4th. This is sort of a feature of um, relational databases is that they're not naturally going to be sorted. Um, database engineers, database administrators will build things called indexes that make the queries work uh, more efficiently, depending on the most common types of searches. Uh, <clears throat> per Presumably that didn't happen in this case, that's fine, because I can use uh, my other deplier verbs to do the sorting, right? So I brought that back into um, an object name right there called uh, JHU COVID-19 Durham since April. If I wanna sort that, um, I can just pipe it to my deplier verb or my deplier function called arrange and arrange by date, and um, some of that query took place remotely at the computational site, right? Because I didn't, I think that's right, JHU. Yeah, because my JHU is remote. But I can also apply, just, I don't mean to make this complicated, but one of these is a pointer to remote data. And one of these is local data that I just collected. So one of them is actually gonna happen more quickly because it's local and it's not a lot of data, whereas the other one is remote. But if we're talking about querying huge quantities of data, this one, which is querying remotely, may in fact be more efficient than this one, which would have to churn through all of my local RAM if I had millions and millions of rows. There's different ways to do it. All right, now let's get to the good stuff in terms of visualizing. Um, simplest thing to do is to do something like this where I've got my remote query, and then I'm going to do some sorting and eventually uh, do some mutating and eventually pipe it to ggplot, right? Okay, so this is essentially the, um, the exact example that I was trying to set up at the beginning, which is that I'm doing my compute and transformation of data remotely at, big, at Google BigQuery cloud servers. And then I'm visualizing locally because I'm pulling back only the data that I want to look at to visualize. And this is just a count of the deaths due to COVID since um, April 1st. And I just, you know, we're playing around with the visual qualities so that you could see uh, both a linear regression and a lowest smooth regression and see the basic trends. And I colored them based on um, whether or not there were more than one death a day, low, medium, and high. Okay. In this next co uh, code chunk, I'm doing something similar. Um, there's not a lot of difference here. Uh, the only difference, this is just more ggplot, so it's not super relevant. Um, but again, it's 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 focusing the visual uh, the visual computation is focused on my local computer, so I can you know I can do all kinds of things to make this plot look slightly different from that plot uh, while maintaining most of the data transformation up in the cloud. 
here's a similar thing where I'm just uh, renaming some data to some variables and resorting and selecting just a subset of those data rather than all of the columns that I was bringing back originally. Uh, here's a kind of a cool thing, just, just in case you're interested. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but when, you, when you're working in, um, in our, our Markdown notebooks, you can, um, right, you can start a new code chunk, which we typically do this way, where we choose an R code chunk. But uh, we can also start an SQL code chunk it's right here. And I typically say that means you have to have some kind of database server installed locally. But really, the truth is, what I found out is you don't have to have the SQL server installed locally, the relational database server installed locally. You can use that same connection property that we created way back at the beginning of the script. And then you can identify what the output of the SQL query will be, and it'll make a special data frame, right? In this case, I'm going to call it special data frame. So if I were to run this query, and I will, um, I'll have a new variable show up in my environment that's similar to all the others I have, and it'll be called special data frame, right? So it's the exact same as this one. But this is done just with an SQL code chunk rather than an R code chunk. Um, in that way, you can also mix other languages, right? You can mix Python if you happen to be a Python programmer as well. All right, <clears throat> so here we have special DF and we're just gonna visualize special DF. It's not gonna work any differently than you would expect. This is just a scatter plot of deaths over uh, confirmed cases with, uh, by tagging a certain two of the higher numbered counties. Uh, all of that happened on, I think this is for June, yeah, June 30th. But now let's get into, um, doing a different query of a different data set, right? So there's also, aside from COVID cases, there's also the Austin bike share um, data set, which has several tables in it. And one of those tables is called bike trips. And again, the way I figured that out was by browsing at the Google console, uh, console at the Google platform console, not the RStudio console. But I'm gonna make a new connection right here. I'm gonna call it connection two for BigQuery bikes. And then I'm going to make a pointer specifically to the bike shares table. And then I can query that with my collect statement. And what this is gonna do is it's literally gonna bring back all of the data because I followed it with the collect statement. So not very efficient, but it's gonna be fine. As long as I don't hit my terabyte um, limit during this session for the month of February. Uh, it's taking a little longer than I expected, but I can get a progress bar right there. And let's see what we brought back. Um, I brought back, ooh, it just said it was billed. It billed me 136.31 um, megabytes. And I don't, I don't know if, um, if that's new or not. I haven't been paying attention to those things. Uh, but it also tells me that I downloaded a million two rows, right? 1,264,000. Um, and 127 pages of data. I'm not sure exactly how it's calculating pages, but uh, this is the data. And you can see right here that that object just showed up as a data frame. And that's because I used collect. So let me expand that out to one screen and you can kind of get a sense of what's in here, a bunch of data from a bike sharing company that tracks all of the bikes that they share. I can use this glimpse command like I've used before to tell me that in this case, the glimpse command is gonna tell me how many rows there are because I pulled all the data down, but it's also gonna tell me that other things about the data that I wanna know. And then I wanna start visualizing it. And these visualizations aren't gonna be any different from what you would normally do because um, I started by pulling all the data down with the collect state. So all this particular, I'm not sure that this is a particularly great visualization, but um, this is based on this link right here that is an article that sort of tries to answer the question, how far is too far to bike to work? And the basic answer is 10 minutes. So I just did some box plots where I sorted 
all the bike trips under 10 minutes and all the bike trips after 10 minutes. And I uh, labeled them um, and looked at like, what was the average length of a trip under 10 minutes and before 10 minutes based on these different categories of passes that you could buy to the bike share company. All right, so that's not especially interesting because in the end, because I use this collect statement, uh, it's not anything different than I would normally do if I just found the bike share data out on GitHub and pulled it all down. But it assumes uh, that your computer is powerful enough to process a million two hundred thousand rows of data, which I know mine is. But if I was using one of those um, BCMs or the or one of the cloud-based R studios, maybe it wouldn't be. Uh, so let's go then to that last bit that I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> well, let's see what I'm doing here. Oh, this is where I'm doing a join. And so I have this thing called bike share trips, which I think not certain. I think I must have done this earlier and I didn't pay attention. I'm just like class, bike share trips. Yeah, this is um, this is a big query table. So it's just a, it's not it's not anything more than a pointer to the Austin bike share data without collect. Um, and then I'm going to do a merge remotely at that data frame by calling one bit of data. What I'm doing, this is sort of a better example of how to push your computation off to the SQL server. What's happening here, if I run these, these rows right here, is I am taking the top 5% of trips for the top five stations where uh, a bike was at a start station, right? So in other words, 72,000 trips started at the intersection of 21st Street and Speedway and 31,000 started at the convention center in 4th Street, right? So that's the top 5% of all bike trips for the bike share company and what stations they're at. All of that computation got translated into SQL and took place at the SQL server. I'm gonna do the same query for the end station. So end station versus start station. And then I'm gonna merge them together so that I can get, um, so that I can look at a table side by side and I might choose to do some kind of visualization with that information. But what I pulled back and what I sent over the wire was nine rows of data, right? I somehow went through a million two rows of data and pulled back only nine rows. That's what, that's what dbplyr is really doing. All right, so um, last bit. Uh, here's a DB connection to the New York Trees data set. So this is what I started out um, showing you. And so I'm just gonna make that connection to New York Trees. I'm gonna give it my billing project ID. And uh, once I make that connection, I will specifically search the tree census for 2015. There were several tables there, but I just want the most recent one that I can find. And then I'm gonna use these two new libraries dbplot and leaflet. Um, if you've been to some of um, Drew's workshops, you've had some background on leaflet and there's a recording of how Drew was showing people how to use, how to do visualizations with leaflet. We're basically, we're gonna use that to create a dynamic map. And dbplot is a special uh, new library, part of the tidyverse that is really designed to also push as much of the visualization computation as is possible off into the remote server, right? So you're always limiting what data you're pulling down. But let's get a quick sense because I don't know before we go much further. Well, I should learn, I should run both of those libraries in case they're not running. Oh, I got it right here. I want to see how big this data set is. And not only how big is the data set, but um, what are the data types? So I actually only got a count from one variable curb location. If I go over here to this and I can find curb location wherever it is, uh, it's in here somewhere. Probably won't find it because it's too hard to see, but um, curb location is made up basically of two variables. 
And I don't think there's any NA because the NA didn't come back. But it looks like there's about um, 75,000 rows in the data set. And, or, or roughly 70,000, 700,000, sorry, that's what I meant to say. Um, and I wanted this just deal with this part of the data set. So I could pull that down locally, 26,000 rows, not so much of a big deal. But instead, I'm going to show off this function of dbplot that I mentioned, where what it's going to do is it's going to rasterize the data, which I can't exactly explain what rastering does, but it's like histogram. It puts, it takes counts of your data and puts them into bins, right? And it's particularly useful for mapping, but it's not only used for mapping, I don't think. And so I'm saying that I want to have a certain default resolution here of 30. And it's bringing me back a, uh, what looks sort of like a choropleth, shaded regions where the lighter regions have more trees based on the categories, right? Categories are curb location is offset from curb and the health of the tree is good. And then rasterize that based on the latitude and longitude, which are, which are variables in the remote data set, right? Um, you'll see that in just a second. And it brings back this map, which if you're familiar with New York, this is actually fairly um, explanatory. But if you're not familiar with New York, and we're going to do some more to make that clear, it just looks like a bunch of funky little squares. Uh, but if you're familiar with New York, uh, you know that that's Staten Island. That's probably Manhattan on the left and Harlem up here and the Bronx right here, uh, Long Island right there. But let's, let's process this more so that it becomes a better map for us. Uh, and But anyway, the other way to read this is that there's a high concentration of healthy off-curb trees here and a high concentration there and a high concentration there. And there's probably no data for this section. And I happen to know from looking at the map once I did more work, uh, what that region is. I'll leave it as a cliffhanger so you can see. But we're gonna take that same data set and this time count to see how many data, uh, how many uh, rows we're dealing with, just because I'm curious. And then the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use uh, DB compute raster rather than DB plot raster so that it will it'll give us an opportunity to uh, compute, visualize, to visualize locally and just do some more advanced uh, visualization with DB Compute Raster. Because DB Compute Raster doesn't bring back an image, it brings back data, right? It brings back latitude, uh, longitude, latitude, and the number of instances in each one of the bins, right? That's what this column is. So then we're gonna further um, tweak that. By the way, some of this code I borrowed from uh, the guy who's developing this package. His name is up here somewhere, uh, Edgar Ruiz. So if you want to look at his video presentation, you can you can get some more information about that. Uh, but what we brought back, it looks like 364 rows of data rather than the 700,000. So we did all of that compute over there and just brought back 364 rows of data with latitude, longitude, and frequency number. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use something called tidy evaluation to create a new function called size. Uh, I won't go into this too much, but it just means like, like you can use the mutate function or the select function, you can create a function called size that does some calculations to help us. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out the dimensions of each, uh, not the dimensions, but the coordinate corners of each one of the, the raster squares. Right? We're going to do that computationally so that we can do all of them at once. And this is more of that, uh, where we're computing the size of the latitude distance and longitude distance that we can then create a new data frame called square or SQ, which I'll go ahead and display here. And so now we have this table that we're going to then, we're going to visualize the data with this information, right? So we have lawn one, lawn two, lat one, lat two, are the four corners of each square, and then how big the square is going to be, and then a sort of a percentage of the data that we're going to, I think that's what we're going to use to visualize the, the to color in the squares. Um, so if we take all that, if we take SQ, right, there's the data frame right there, and we send that to Leaflet, we're going to come back with uh, a dynamic map that looks like this. 
right? Which we can we can zoom in and zoom out. This is something that Drew can tell you more about. Although you'll notice that the squares are not colored in, right? Uh, you can start to answer that question of what what is right there where we don't have any data. But we'll again we'll, we'll leave a cliffhanger um, because we're almost done. This is good, but it's not good enough because it doesn't give us the frequency information. So I'm going to take that same leaflet map, and uh, that's the bulk of that is right here. Then I'm going to add a different uh, background map, and I'm going to uh, do the choropleth style fill in of colors based on um, the of max variable, which is right here. It defines the opacity of the square, right? And when I run that, which I don't have to because it's in my it's in it's in my memory, um, I get this nice map, and then I can see where the most trees are. Now the only downside of this particular map is that if there's a lot of trees, like up here on the the upper west side, uh, there's so many trees that I can't really drill down so much to find out what's under that. But where there are not a lot of trees, it's easier to see. So for example, I had that blank spot in the map um, over here. And that, as it turns out, if you look on a different, um, with a different base map, it's clearly labeled as Rikers Island, right? Uh, so there's the Rikers Island Bridge, which I've never been to. And um, the only thing I know probably is through movies. Uh, Rikers Island is some kind of prison complex uh, rehabilitation complex. I, I couldn't give you the exact definition, but I don't know if it's the case that there are no trees here. I suppose we could switch to a satellite view, or if they just didn't let people onto the island to do the tree counting. Uh, and we could we could try and answer some of those questions. But I found this. I was just playing around with these different views. Um, I found this particular section really interesting. Like, why is that have so many off off the curb trees? And there's a nature preserve right there. Um, anyway, all of that was done just pointing out by only transferring 364 rows of the original 700,000 rows. So that's the idea of querying remote databases, doing your computation remotely, but pulling back the information locally just so you can visualize locally. Um, that's pretty much everything I wanted to tell you about how this works. I hope I told you the right stuff. I hope I told you what you wanted to know. Uh, you will get in your email a link to this feedback form, but I'm going to put it in the, in the chat right now and open it up for questions because I know I didn't take a lot of breaths. So if you if you had a question. I would love to try and answer it. Uh, if you don't have a question, that's totally fine. Looks like Johan's about to ask a question. Hi. Thanks, John. Hi. Sure. Um, this might be kind of a silly question. Um, I'm new to all the cloud stuff, so I'm not sure. Um, but just to be clear, um, should we be able to run this, uh, this notebook exactly as it is, or will we get an error if we try to use your credentials? for the you will, uh, DB Connect call? That's definitely, that's a great question. Um, you will get an error if you, you use this billing value right here. So that's the only thing that you should have to change. Got it. Now, just, just to, if you want, I'll show you where that came from so you can figure out what to change it to. Um, I do, by the way, let me zoom back out. I have a file in here called Your Turn, uh -huh. which is really simplified and leave some blanks for things that you should put in here um, rather than relying on what I put in. But to go back to this statement, this billing is really a project ID. I'll go to my console. That billing ID came from right here. So when you, when you create a new project, it will give you an ID for your project. You can call it anything you want, like my first project. And I think it, I think when I did my first project, it actually gave me a billing, a, a randomly generated billing ID, but you can change it. 
And then you just need to you just need to use that value um, in this section right here. And then when you do that, the whole thing should run. If there are no, not other questions, no, go ahead, go ahead. Thanks, I just said, you were explaining uh, when we are still on the server side and, and when, at what point we hop over to the client side and you explained that the collect function is one way to do that. Um, but then you also did some mapping um, totally in the cloud and understand that there's a little bit that needs to come to, to, to my side to do the mapping. But like, for example, I make every use of GG save if I do everything on the cloud side and then end with GG save, what happens? Yeah, so what should happen then is it should send just, just the uh, size of the file that you saved. Will I get I believe the file? That, yeah, you should get the file. You should be able to save that file locally. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Yep. But also this, I don't know that I made this point super clear, but this approach to querying remote databases, we just used Google BigQuery as one example. And there are lots of data to query there, but you may have access to a different relational database in the cloud. And you can, you can generalize what we've done. I'd be happy to help you get started there. We just need to know some ODBC connection information to query other remote databases that are not part of Google BigQuery. Does that make sense? Yes, and that would, that would be a different a different R library. Um, it should be the same. I didn't, I actually didn't draw out the documentation like I had hoped to, but db, let's see, that's not it. Um, db.rstudio. Um, we loaded this library, the dbi package, which I'm pretty certain is the package that you're using to broker most of the ODBC connections, but there are different kinds of connections to make. But with the DBI package or some of these other packages, like you can connect to Oracle servers, MSQL servers, the list goes on. I see. Um, Redshift is the Amazon version of, of Google BigQuery. Right. Um, I see that there's MSQL server here, and I don't know if that's related to um, the, the Microsoft version of Google BigQuery is something called, uh, is, a, is a product on top of uh, Azure. Uh, Azure, right? And the university has access to Azure, and I've done just enough research to be able to say that you should be able to apply Azure databases to this as well. So if you can get on the university's backbone, you could kind of ignore all those all those comments I made conservatively about billing, right? Because the university is probably not going to charge you for that. Okay, well. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a couple more minutes if, uh, if there are other questions, but I have told you everything that I hope to uh, that I had hoped to accomplish. And since this is the work the first workshop I've done, um, if you want to put anything in the feedback that would help me think about how to do this a second time, I would love to get your feedback. And thanks for your attention. Thank you.